Hey everybody, Paul Lake here with another physics problem solved. Uh, this one comes from one of my tutoring clients uh, who's taking AP Physics 1. And I do uh, tutor students in AP Physics 1, AP Physics uh, 2, AP Physics C, and College Freshman Physics. So if you need to tutor, check the uh, notes in the description and you'll find a link that will allow you to get in touch with me. Um, today's problem, I, I give it a title, The Maximum Speed of a car moving in a circle. And this is kind of a classic problem. You, you see this in, every, I think, I bet every physics textbook has a version of this problem in it. So let's, uh, let's read the problem. Uh, a car moves around a flat circular racetrack at a constant speed. A, what is the maximum speed at which the car can travel without skidding if the radius of the track is 80 meters and the coefficient of friction, in this case, static friction, is 0.4. And then what's the maximum safe speed when the track is wet? So here the coefficient of friction is half of, of what it was here. So um, again, a uh, very, very common problem. You'll see this a lot. Now here's what you need to know before we really get started. You should be familiar with centripetal force and centripetal acceleration and what they mean and what the equations are that describe them. Um, you should be able to draw a free body diagram, know how to, how to do that, how to, and how to deal with friction, in this case, static friction. And we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about that uh, as we solve the problem. So I, uh, I highly recommend that you pause the video now and try to do this problem yourself. And, um, and hey, if you find this helpful, please give me a thumbs up and it'll get the word out to more physics students out there. And, and if you are a physics student, I suggest you uh, subscribe to my channel. And if you leave a suggestion in the comments, uh, like if you're having a problem, uh, write out the problem and ask me to solve it, and maybe I'll make a video out of it. Um, my channel's not that big, so, <laughs> so I can do that sort of thing. Anyway, let's get started. Um, here's what's given. Okay, so we've got a car. It's going around a circular track. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this uh, in a little bit of pers with a little bit of perspective here. Um, I'm just going to kind of draw it like this. Here's the circle. It's moving in a circle. And then here's the car. I'll just draw the car like this. Now the radius of this circle, R, is 80 meters. And um, the coefficient of friction, uh, mu, is uh, 0 0.40. Not a very grippy road. It's all right. That's fairly slippery for a road. Okay, and now this car is moving at a constant speed. We'll call that B. So this is uniform circular motion. And what are we trying to find? Well, we're trying to find, well, for A, we're trying to find V max. And that's if, if the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.4. And then in part B, we just want the same thing, but with a different static coefficient um, of 0.2. Uh, okay, so the part B, once we get part A done, part B is super easy. But there's a really interesting point to be made, so we'll, we'll get to that. All right, so um, let's solve it. So this is a problem that involves force. And so I, um, and we're trying to find, you know, maximum speed and all that. So I'm going to start with a free body diagram of the car. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, change my perspective. Here's the the, well, here's the car. I'm not very good at drawing cars. Here's, I guess I'll make it a Jeep or something. So here's like a big, you know, SUV. Here's the driver and maybe there's a passenger and rear view mirror and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so enough. Um, and, um, and it's obviously, it's coming right at us. It's coming towards the camera here. Um, now, we want to draw the forces that are acting on the car. So, obviously, gravity is trying to pull it down, right? So we've got the force of gravity, which is the mass of the car, times Earth's gravitational field. And that's how I like to... Um, I, you can put F sub G, but I just put MG there. Um, for uh, this is the mass of the car. Do you notice that they didn't give us the mass of the car? If that happens in a problem like this, don't panic. It will probably cancel out. Okay, so 
Anyway, and then uh, why isn't this car accelerating towards the center of the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared? Because it's on the ground, and the ground is pushing up on it with a normal force. And that normal force is spread out over the all four wheels, but I'm only going to draw it as one force like that. So there's my normal force. Now this car is moving in a circle, so something is pushing it towards the center of that circle. There's some kind of centripetal force there. But what is that force? What force is making this car move in a circle? It's the friction between the wheels and the road. That's my, that's the force that's sideways like this, the force of friction. And uh, now think about it. this makes sense, right? I mean, what if the, have you ever been driving on a really slippery road? Maybe it's iced over or it's wet or something and you go and you, you can slip out of that turn. So um, you need friction to control your car. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But, uh, but these are all, these are the only forces acting, normal force, gravity, and this force of friction. Okay. So <clears throat> um, I'm going to define positive X to be in this direction and positive Y to be in this direction. Uh, I know that the acceleration has to be towards the center of that circle. And I've dra drawn the car from here to here. So if I know the direction of the acceleration, I usually make that uh, a positive axis direction. So if I know the direction, the acceleration is to the left, I make to the left positive X. It's okay, you can do that. Now, um, now I'm going to sum the, I'm gonna apply Newton's second law, um, which is if I add up all the forces in the X direction, that should equal to the mass times the acceleration of the car in the X direction. Now, when you, if you're not familiar with this notation, this is the summation notation, you've probably done that in math. We're adding up, all the forces in the x direction. If you do that, if you, <clears throat> that's the net force. And the net force, as you know, equals mass times acceleration. So this is really the net force. But this tells me what to do. Now let's look at my free body diagram and go, oh, I've only got one force, and that's that force of friction. And that's going to be equal to m times a. But what is uh, the acceleration. Well, it's, the, it's an acceleration that doesn't change your speed. It changes the direction of your velocity vector. Remember, vectors have magnitude and direction. If you speed up or slowing, slow down, you're accelerating, your acceleration is changing the magnitude of your velocity. But if you have a uh, a, a net force that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, then that net force is going to cause an acceleration that doesn't change your speed, it changes the direction. And I mean, think about it, when the car's, you know, if this car's moving around like this, if the car's right here, right, that centripetal force is, when, if it's right here, it's, it's always pointed towards the center of the circle, right? The force and the acceleration that it causes are always pointing. And that's why it's called centripetal. The word centripetal means center seeking, I guess, in Latin or something like that. I don't know. That's what I was told. And we know, you should know, that the centri that this is a centripetal acceleration, that centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius of your turn. That's kind of a basic equation you need to know to solve circular motion problems. Okay, so we've got that. <clears throat> now, I uh, don't know what the force of friction is, uh, but there's velocity, and that is what I'm trying to find. Well, the force of friction is equal to mu times the normal force, right? Now, if this is a static coefficient of friction, then what this gives you is the maximum possible uh, friction. Uh, and so if you, ex if, you, if you exceed this force, then the object will not, uh, uh, it, it won't be a static uh, friction anymore. It'll be kinetic friction. The, the, the wheels 
and the road, the interface between the wheel and the road, they'll start sliding, okay? Now, <coughs> even though the car is not static, the car is in motion in a circle, but the contact between the wheel and the road is static. That is, there's no sliding between those two surfaces. When a, when, when, when a tire uh, moves, well, let's see. Here's a, I'll use my coaster here. And, and maybe the bottom of the paper will be the... When, when a wheel goes down the road, this contact point between the wheel and, and the road here, the, the, the black desk here is the road, um, they don't slide with respect to each other. There is no... It's not doing this. This would be kinetic friction. But you instead have this, and that contact you know, between the tire and, and the road, it's, it's not sliding. So you have static friction. And that's what you want. You want static friction because um, kinetic friction between your, your tire and the road means you've lost control of your car. That's bad. So uh, you want, you know, those wheels engaged, giving you a good static friction between the, the wheels and the road. Anyway, getting back to this, this is, uh, um, and this is mv squared over r. Now, just to be super rigorous about this, um, I'm going to sum the forces in the y direction equals ma in the y direction. And notice that when I add add the forces in the y direction, well, I look in the y direction, well, I've got the normal forces in the positive y direction minus my weight. And the minus is because the gravity is, is straight down, right? So uh, that's in the negative y direction. I could go put plus negative mg, but I just put minus mg. And then this is equal to what? What's the acceleration in the y direction? Well, hopefully it's zero. Right? The car is constrained to move in this flat plane. It's not going to move vertically, right? Um, so, uh, so there's not any velocity in the y direction, and there's certainly no acceleration in the y direction. So that's zero. Well, what this tells us is, oh, the normal force is just equal to the weight of the car. Now, you don't really, if, if, you're, if you've been doing this for a while, you can really just look at the free body and say, oh, okay, uh, the normal force is just supporting the weight because there's no accel vertical acceleration. I mean, yeah, that's fine, but I, I like to show it formally like this um, for my videos. Now, uh, mu, so we got mu static times the normal force, but that's mg equals mv squared over r. Now, this is cool because, look, there's mass here and here. They, they didn't give us the mass of the car. The mass cancels out. Now this this is great because what this means is that as as long if you if you have tire rubber and asphalt, um, you don't need to have a different speed limit for like a little bitty car and a great big SUV or something, because the mass of the car doesn't really matter, and so um, I mean it, it cancels out of the equation. All right, so now we can solve for v. So V squared is equal to mu static, just multiply by R times G. Oh, we'll take the square root. Well, we'll take the square root of both sides. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and then we get V equals the square root of, well, mu S for part A anyway is 0 0.4. We'll assume three significant figures for everything. This is 80 meters and G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Let's check the units. We've got meters times meters. That's meters squared per second squared. Square root that. You get meters per second. So that's good. The units work. And when you plug all this in your calculator, you get 17.7 .7 meters per second. And that's my answer. So if you um, exceed this speed, you will need more force than the road and tire can handle and you'll skid off. So uh, if you're a race car driver, what you're trying to do is approach this maximum speed um, and without uh, going faster then. Because if you go faster, you'll lose control of the car. And that's the skill of driving. That's one of the skills of driving is knowing 
where that edge is as you go around a turn. All right, for part B, let's talk about part B. Now, um, if I uh, notice here that the coefficient of friction is half. Here's the coefficient of friction is 0.4, and here it's 0.2. So you might think, oh, well, we've got half the coefficient of friction, so that must mean it's half the speed, right? And that would be wrong. Uh, so you have to be really careful because where is the coefficient of friction located? It's located under this square root. I mean, it gets square rooted. So if it's half as big, it's going to be not, uh, if the coefficient of friction is half, the, uh, the maximum velocity allowed is going to be um, what it was divided by the square root of 2. Not divided by 2, but divided by the square root of 2 which is obviously smaller than two, so you get a bigger velocity. So let, let's just do the calculation and see. Um, v equals the square root of mu rg, so that's 0 0.2 times r times g. And so when you do that, plug that in your calculator and you get 12.5 meters per second. So this is my answer for part B. Um, and so <clears throat> notice that it's not half. But hey, do this right now. Take this number and divide it by the square root of 2. And you'll get this. Kind of interesting. Uh, one thing to add to this, notice that the um, the really the maximum speed, um, if it's really dependent on that normal force, isn't it? Now, here's something that um, you might be interested in doing. In this situation right here, the normal force is just supporting the weight. What, what if I had? If, what if I could figure out a way of making this normal force even bigger than the weight? If the normal force is bigger than, than just the weight, if it's mg plus something else, well. That means I can have a faster maximum speed. So how do race cars get a bigger normal force between the tires and the road? Well, I'll, I'll try to sketch a race car here, uh, like a, a real race car. It's got little fins right here, and then you got a, a driver and all, all that, right? That's not too bad. But what have you got up here? You got a spoiler of some kind, or spoiler, is that what they call it? Anyway, what it is, it's a wing on the car. It's, it's a wing, it's an airfoil. But what does this airfoil do? Instead of lifting up on it, which would be really bad, it's an upside down wing. And so as the air comes across it, it pushes down on the car. And by the way, so does this part of the car. This, why are they wedge shaped in the front? Because you want this downward aerodynamic force pushing down on the car. Now what that does, okay, we also have the gravity, right? We have mg of the car, but we have this, th these aerodynamic forces pushing down, which means that your normal force has to be even greater than the weight. What does that mean? That means you can go faster. So that's why you see these, these things uh, like this on, on race cars is so they can go faster. And every once in a while, one of these things, sometimes this, this force is, is, is bigger, bigger than the weight of the car. Um, and so if they break off in the middle of a turn, which has been known to happen, they, they, it's a crash. They, they skid off the road. Anyway, that's kind of interesting stuff. Classic high school and college freshman physics problem. How... What's the maximum speed you can go around a turn given a certain coefficient of friction? And here it is. Hope that was uh, clear. And uh, please give this video a thumbs up if, you, uh, if it helped you. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Uh, leave a comment. And uh, when you do, if you leave a problem there, just type out the problem. Make sure it's complete and everything. And if I like it, I'll make a video out of it. And I'll let you know. Anyway, until then, may the net force be with you.